Dear God, thank you for bringing us together as a family. As Britain prepares to go to war with Nazi Germany, Marianne arrives at Morley House, the new posting of her vicar husband Linus, along with her daughter Adelaide. Unbeknownst to them, the last couple that lived in the house died in a horrific murder-suicide, one that their malevolent handler Bishop Malachi sought to cover up. Even worse, the demonic forces that motivated the crime are still hanging around the place, and make themselves known pretty sharpish. As the creepy goings-on begin to play havoc with the mental health of the house's inhabitants, Marianne joins forces with disgraced ghost hunter Harry Reid to get to the bottom of the building's sordid past. What's the time, Stowell? Addy? The Banishing marks the return of director Christopher Smith to the horror genre where he made his name in the noughties with British cult classics like Triangle and Severance. Now those movies were marked out for their invention, for being sort of unique. Severance is basically a dark workplace comedy played as a horror, while Triangle uses this inventive misdirection and convoluted chronology to keep the viewer guessing. The Banishing treads, I think, altogether more familiar ground with its gothic religious horror, while still having enough stylistic flourishes to rise somewhat above the very crowded field. So the bare-bones supernatural plot of the film kicks off pretty sharply. Adelaide is barely in the house for a couple of minutes before she's found a creepy doll. Well, a few, actually. Uh, there's your typical porcelain face with no eyes type of doll, and also some wrapped in rough cloaks made of sackcloth. You know, your more rustic variety of effigy. This is the first of many James Wan-adjacent touches sprinkled throughout the film. It's clear that the intent was to model the supernatural elements of this on something like The Conjuring, and its ugh, cinematic universe. Sure enough, a few scenes later, Adelaide is laying the dolls out in eerie tableaus of rituals and saying that they told her to do it. So far, so formulaic. But there is a fair bit more going on under the hood here. Quite quickly, the house starts to drive its inhabitants mad. But unlike lots of stories with that approach, this film actually goes some way to showing you how that works in practice. Early on, for instance, Marianne is sat at her dresser, brushing her hair, when someone or something watches through the keyhole. She turns when she hears a noise, at which point the film cuts to a dilapidated hospital corridor with a disoriented Marianne walking around it. She stops at a door, and looks for a keyhole, seeing herself at the dresser. Now we're back in the room with her. It's an impressive bit of disjointed storytelling that retains just enough sense that you can follow it. And it's also a lot more inventive than the usual hallucinations people have in spooky movies. And I think quite reminiscent of sections of Triangle to boot, which by the way is a fab film if you haven't checked it out already. As it transpires, the house has a real talent for peeling back the layers of its inhabitants, preying on Linus and Marianne's insecurities in particular. It's quickly apparent that there's something off in their relationship. They don't seem to have lived together, they don't know each other's habits, and sex is off the cards entirely. This subtext of marital dysfunction and shame underpins lots of the film's psychodrama, much more successfully than the other subtext of the film, which is the idea that somehow the spooky goings-on at the house reflects the rise of fascism over in Europe. I just can't quite thread those two together. I don't really see the connection. And after watching the film, I'm not sure the filmmakers did either. But that's the subtext. The plain text of the film is very much standard demons and ghouls territory, and mostly ripped from real life reports of hauntings at Borley Rectory. Do you get it? Morley House, Borley Rectory. Borley was once the supposedly most haunted location in the UK, and it was chiefly publicized by parapsychologist Harry Price. Yes, Harry Price, like Harry Reid in the film. Hmm? Reading between the lines, it certainly seems that the idea for this was to be a Borley Rectory movie, and the IMDb cast list actually has actor Sean Harris down as playing Price, not called Reid, on that credit list. I wonder whether it was always supposed to be a kind of serial numbers filed off Borley Rectory movie. Nevertheless, in my mind, this actually makes the film a bit more palatable. I hate stuff that shows real-life ghost hunters as actually successful. Price was an interesting guy. He was an important figure in UK parapsychology and one who did lots of debunking, but he was also a relentless self-promoter and very hard to trust. He definitely falsified details about his own life and arguably about his cases as well. Now, I don't mind movies where ghosts and demons are real, but ones that portray real-life parapsychologists as correct and like right about the world add to a mythology around them that's entirely undeserved. And yes, the Warrens of the Conjuring fame are absolutely the worst examples of this. Although, of course, they call themselves demonologists. 
Still, this is fiction, and despite its suspiciously similar substitutes, Reed is not Price. He even has his own dark backstory invented for the movie. Harris is obviously good in the role, he's typically good, it's kind of expected. I think he's perhaps a little overblown, and could maybe do without the weird hair dye. He absolutely chews his way through the scenery, injecting a little bit of fun, I think, into a, a gothicness that's occasionally over-serious. And for what it's worth, despite its apparently low budget, the film does play the single house location for all it's worth, with great production design and some fantastically evocative lighting. I was really impressed by the cinematography in this one. As the film progresses, the derivative Conjuring-esque stuff sort of drops away, it stops trying to be a British Blumhouse film, and the horror starts to turn again towards the weird time and space stuff, which I think on balance is a more interesting approach that opens up a lot near the end of the film. Sometimes when watching this, I had the feeling that Smith and co were more interested in making a artsy, psychological film, and were pushed into featuring more typical genre elements because they were just way less developed. It was like they didn't have as much interest from the production team in them. And unfortunately that means that it ends up feeling like an incomplete idea for a better film, perhaps. One that's wrapped up in otherwise familiar genre elements. Still, a low budget British horror film, well designed and executed with interesting twists on the very well trodden haunted house genre. If that sounds like your bag, then I'm sure you'll enjoy The Banishing. Now that's it on the movie, but there's lots of interesting stuff to discuss about it. How do you feel about portrayals of real life parapsychologists in horror movies? Or if you're looking for a topic of discussion that's less specific, what about that kind of encroaching, conjuring-esque vibe that every horror seems to need at the moment? Let me know your opinions on that and other stuff around The Banishing in the comments below. I'd love to have a chat with you. That's it from me, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.